I think a lot of people have very strong thoughts on this and don't we don't talk about it enough. I want to talk about the concept of making one's bed. Oh um, my God. This is where we're going with this. Okay. This is where we're right. going with this. Yep. I'm changing you know what? Fine. We're we really talk about a lot of things. We talk about ourselves politics, a couple now. We talk about news, we talk about pop culture, and we talk about life. And this is one that's important. So <laughs> This is so pathetic. Some people make their bed and others don't. And actually, we should look this up. Okay. Most people do not do it. Um, 37% of people say they make their bed. And then there's a some, no, no. 20%, See, sometimes 14%. You're already, you're, already doing, you're already doing two black and white. Because it's not just do you make your bed or do you not. It's do you make, do you make your bed every single day? Yeah. Do you make your bed a lot of the time, but not every day? Or do you not make your bed? Th- like those okay. are sort of your categories. So I am on the, the side of things where I'm on the side where I believe you should always make your bed. Because here's why. If you're going to accomplish anything, you have to accomplish one thing first and making your bed is the first thing you accomplish. And then you can start accomplishing other things. And the other thing, if you have a rough day, you can come home and you got a nice, lovely made bed to be in. And there are certain people, particularly Carly Riley, who think this is illogical. I'm not like anti making the bed. Here's where the illogicalness comes in, right? I do not like accomplish less in my day because my bed was not made. So that's where I say there's no actual logical reason to have to make your bed. This is an emotional response thing that for some people works very well. So apparently for Zachary, like he's just emotionally on a better page if he knows the bed is made. That's where I come down. So I would love to know what other people think on this. Do you make the bed every single day? Oh, and within the first 30 minutes. Because if you make it like in the afternoon, for example, that's unacceptable. We wake up, get it out of the way. You make it a must. It's like brushing your teeth. It's like putting on deodorant. It's just like a part no. of your okay, good. Perfect. things you there have are to do. Logical, there are high, much more logical reasons to brush your teeth and, and put on deodorant. This is exactly where you and I start to disagree, right? So brushing your teeth is hygienic reasons. You need to take care of your teeth or they will fall out and you won't be able to eat food and you'll die at 40, right? Like, th- like there are actual reasons you need to brush your teeth that are very logical and about your own health. So sound off, team. Um Come at us. Do you, are you a bed maker? Or are you every not? day, or just we'll most do a, we'll days? We'll do a always, sometimes, rarely, never. Yes, um, always, sometimes, rarely, Twitter. never. Where are you on the bed making spectrum? Where are you on the bed making? And I would like your comments. If you do support the making the bed all the time, please let me know. Give me that solidarity. Okay, making the bed crew. People are going to be like, it's logical to make your bed because yep, like human. It's awesome. No, because like human reactions are such that like oh yeah, give me are the involuntary that they feel good. Not for me, though. I don't know. I'm an anomaly. I'll talk about Shikari Richardson. Um, She is our best female runner in the Olympics, um, upcoming Olympics. And she was disqualified from the Olympics because she tested positive for THC or marijuana. Um, And it's been really interesting to me to watch this because people have come down very strongly on one side. It's like what I want to do with like having things and having topics on the show is when people are like freaking out about something, like have a rational conversation about it. People have come down very strongly on either side. Um, And I'm curious your thoughts, Carly, but it seems like this on one hand, um, this is my sense of the argument. On one hand, this is ridiculous. She said she was using, I think she took a brownie because she um, was grieving her grandmother. Um, Her mother, her stepmother. It was like a a mother figure. Yeah. Okay. So she's grieving. So on one hand, like it's freaking marijuana. Like, uh, you know, ridiculous. We should, we should this is legal, disqualifying you with, from right? the games to begin uh, with. And then on the, and in addition, like it's, it's not actually a performance enhancing drug. If anything, it slows you down. Right. So, um, like this is ridiculous. So on one hand, fundamentally, this is a ridiculous rule. Agree with, and I think, I think most people can agree with that unless you're very anti marijuana. On the other hand, and I think that's where I lean is that, and it's what Joe Biden said is that, um, but it is a rule, like rules are rules. Um, and if you want to compete in the Olympics, you have to follow the rules they set, even if they're stupid and archaic. Um, they're not particularly, I don't know if you could argue if they're harming you or not, but they are the rules. You agreed to play by these rules in order to run in the race. Um, and people are very, very strong. And it's um, some of the comments been racially fueled, um, which I understand. Um, I don't, I'd love your thoughts, Carly. And then I guess I'll dive into my more of my opinion. Um, thoughts on, the rule here and, and thoughts on um, Shikari's situation? I think on the micro level, I don't think there's there's racism at play here in that this rule would obviously have been, or I believe, very equally administered if it had been a white player who had done this. I think 
he or she would be facing the same punishment. You and I have talked about there's been examples in football and other sports where you've had white players punished for smoking marijuana. On the macro level, there's a, a very real question to be had around how much we've criminalized marijuana in this country and in the world at large um, as a way to specifically be able to incarcerate black people, you know, like on some level. And so there is this broader criminalizing marijuana thing that feels like it is racist and, and obviously has been used in very racist ways. AOC um, called it racist and colonial. Yeah, I, you know, I, that... Again, I, I think there's a macro argument to be made there. I think in this specific instance, I'm I'm with you. Like these are the rules. I have a ton of empathy for her though, being like, look, I'm human and I did this, and I'm I'm sh I'm I'm surprised too. I mean, presumably she was very aware of the rules and knew she was going to be tested. So it, it just goes to show how much pain she must have been in, and and I really empathize with that. I also will say, like, so in this this particular case, I don't think, like, you know, on, there's a, there's a micro level racism here. Uh, relatedly, though, there's this whole – there's another controversy around um, the Olympics banning certain swim caps that better fit black black women in particular or black, black people in general, but because of their hair. And you had the Olympic Committee saying like, oh, these swim caps aren't the natural shape of a human head. Seriously? And therefore they're banned. Yeah, and oh that's God. clearly racist and insane. And I don't know where we'll end up on that. I mean, I just say – Clearly, we need to allow these swim caps to be used. Um, but I think those are two examples where I come down sort of on different different sides of them, where I think the the weed rule, again, macro level, there's there's probably some racism there in our world for sure. Micro level in this particular instance, I don't think there's racism specifically against Shikari. Swim cap rule, crazy, totally needs to change. And let's just let these well, I women think the use Olympic whatever Committee swim caps is, they want. demonstrated that they're bit behind the times, a bit archaic, yeah. a bit more And I'm sure it's like a bunch um, of white people. Like, I, you know, I doubt there's a lot of diversity on the Olympic Committee. So if that's where ASC is going, I, I understand. I do think, like, if you're an Olympic athlete, you know the rules. Um, and so, like, I, I'm, I was a Josh Gordon fan who was a receiver um, who eventually got suspended and then banned from the NFL or for a number of – I think I guess it's multi-year suspensions close to banning um, for, frankly, just smoking too much weed. Um, and he would do games like drunk and high and still perform at a crazy elite level. Um, uh, but they banned him because those are the rules. And I don't like agree. Like, I think players should be able to smoke marijuana. Like, come on. Um, but that is the rule. Um, so for you, I think everybody should be up in arms about the rule. They shouldn't be up in their arms about this decision about the rule being applied fairly in this case. Right. Um, yeah, I agree. Now I don't know. And this is what I would say. I don't know enough instances, um, about the racial component of this. Have they let white at white athletes sneak through the cracks on these or get more exceptions? I don't actually know. Um, given that they're old school conservative, um, actually, I, I don't know. I don't know. My, my gut would say that like my, um, that they're probably just generally extremely strict. Um, but, um, I don't know. I do feel for her that that sucks. Um, this rule is horrific, horrific. And frankly, as an American, like, damn it, I wanted her to go with her awesome hair and nails and kick everybody's freaking ass. Like, that would have been the real American thing. It was like, yeah, we sent we sent Shikari over there and ran circles around you. Like, hell yeah. And she can do it, like, looking amazing. Um, so that was heartbreaking because I, I like to see when we win. That's like when I, I've always loved that. So um, frustrating. Um, I know people have takes. You can comment on us as well. Last thing, Carl, before we rock and roll. Give me the free Britney update because there is news. Ooh. There is news in the pop culture world and you're my only source. I refuse to yeah. read this. I refuse to give it more clicks. <laughs> well, and, you know, we're, we're we're trying to straddle this line of not going too pop culture deep because I think I'm the only one who really wants to know like who Harry Styles is dating. Uh, it's like me uh, and the Buffalo know, Bills. Just got to give him a taste. Yeah, yeah. Well, well and also the, the Britney movement, I think, also crosses into the that's legal world. Like there's a lot that's interesting here. So there, there's basically kind of two, there's two updates, I would say, broadly, umbrella kind of updates. There's um, what's happening with the conservatorship and, and the team in place around the conservatorship. There's been some big moves there. And then there's sort of personal news. So this past week, Ronan Farrow, who quite famously like busted open a lot of the, the Harvey Weinstein stuff, Ronan and a co-author at The New Yorker did a whole piece about the Free Britney situation. And they exposed a number of new details. For instance, they they talked to a very close family friend of the Spears's who has been present apparently throughout this entire process, who says that 
very early on, um, after the conservatorship was put into place, she witnessed Britney's father like screaming at Britney, calling her a fat whore, like being very verbally abusive towards her. Um, and that she had previously been actually somewhat in favor of the conservatorship and then witnessed some of that, saw some other things and is now very opposed to the conservatorship. So they exposed some sort of family rifts and family details like that, which were honestly all very heartbreaking. Then there's big news on the conservator side. So the the judge in this case, in the current case, um, ruled against uh, moving Jamie Spears, Britney's father, out of the conservatorship. So Jamie is remaining a conservator. Um, now that that's not about whether the conservatorship will end or not. That's, the, that will be a separate, but it's more like who is the conservator. However... Um, the judge did put a second conservator in place to manage her finances with Jamie. And that's this Bessemer Trust, this professional trust group that that does this often for different clients. What's fascinating is that the day after, essentially, Bessemer Trust was put in place as the co-conservator with Jamie Spears, they asked to be removed. And as details have emerged, it sounds like when they were initially approached to be the co-conservator, of this estate. They were approached by a man named Sam Ingram, I believe, who's Britney Spears' attorney. And Sam had told them that this conservatorship was voluntary and that Britney was fine with it. And that that's why Bessemer Trust had agreed to sign on and be this co-conservator. And that after they heard Britney's own testimony in court, they it was made clear to them that this was very much not voluntary, that Britney very much wanted out of it. And so now Bessemer Trust wants out of being a co-conservator. So they were misled and this is what's very interesting, by Britney's own attorney, which feeds this whole broader narrative right now that that Sam, Britney's attorney, is actually much closer to Jamie Spears, and despite being Britney's attorney, is actually working for her conservator more than he's working for her. So the drama just continues. The bottom line is Jamie Spears will remain conservator for the time being, but other conservators are trying to drop out. Britney's talent manager just quit um, and said he doesn't believe Britney's going to return to performing, basically, anytime soon, and so he does, she doesn't need him. Um, and that she's probably in, in a permanent retirement. So bad news for the Britney fans. 